recording. Brilliant. Um, thank you, everyone, for um, coming today. Um, we're going to go without mics. Um, if you need us to speak up at all, please feel free just to let us know. Um, I'd just like to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people, the traditional owners and custodians of this land. Um, I'd also like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Um, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. It's my pleasure today to introduce to you Andrew Atchison, um, whose amazing exhibition we're sitting in here. And Andrew is an artist, an educator, a curator and writer, currently based in um, Melbourne. And Andrew recently, or a few years ago, completed your MFA um, at Monash University here in Melbourne. And that examined uh, relationships between queerness, abstraction and sculpture. Andrew's exhibited extensively, including at Gertrude Contemporary, Incinerator Gallery, Linden New Art, First Draft, West Base, King's, TCB, Seventh, amongst many others. He's completed several artworks for public space, including a public art commission for the city of Melbourne. And in 2019 was curator of the exhibition, Illegible, at the Marta Faculty Gallery at Monash. And he's currently a resident in the studio program at Gertrude Contemporary. So welcome, Andrew. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Um, my name's Tim Riley Walsh, and I'm the curator in residence at Gertrude. Um, and it's um, going to be great today having a chat to Andrew and talking a bit more about the show and about the works and um, digging into um, the sort of uh, research and sort of thinking behind them. So to begin, um, I was wondering, Andrew, if you wouldn't mind discussing a little bit about um, your interest in the field of sculpture, um, what drew you to the field, uh, and we might go from there. Yeah, sure. So um, I didn't train in sculpture. I kind of found my way through it, to it more or less experimentally. So I don't have a classical training in sculpture, but just became more and more interested in um, objects in space as opposed to two-dimensional images and specifically uh, figure in the round sculpture and the idea that you can't behold the entirety of it at one time. So you're always projecting what will be coming around to you and holding in uh, your memory, you know, what you've just seen. And it just seemed to me an interesting dynamic to work with. Um, yeah, and it's just unfolded from there. And my master's project was all around figure in the round sculpture and so this has just kind of kept going and going and going for the last few years. Mm. And so there's been sort of a, a, you know, a focus sort of development on sort of sculptural form from that point in your work? Yeah, like a series of propositions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And using different materials and yeah. Sure. And I guess is there, um, your work doesn't seem to kind of want to sort of, uh, I feel like I hope I'm not putting words in your mouth, but that you feel that there's a certain sort of problematic quality to kind of typical sculpture, or if we think about, you know, an archetype of sculpture in public space that perhaps the desire to kind of create or an idealized form or a strict representation is something that sort of you find troubling and that you've sort of investigated a little bit. Yeah, I mean, um, more like an interesting problem to work with, I would say. So. Yeah, I mean, classical sculpture and its ideals um, kind of carry through to public sculpture. I'm really interested in public well, art, art in outdoor spaces, I should say. Um, and the kind of, uh, the articulation of those forms and more the grammar of those forms. So not so much um, a historical focus on individual figures, but more like the grammar of the genre and um, looking at the decisions behind how those things appear in public space, who is represented, what it means to fix someone in material like that. Also the fu futurity of those sculptures, because you know, bronze has a lifespan of about 2000 years. So, um, you know, looking forwards and looking backwards and yeah. And in terms of figural statuary, it's the most present form of figure in the round sculpture at the moment, I would say. So mm. it's an interesting place to start. Mm. And I guess um, riffing off that and this, there is this kind of sense of kind of great visibility and um, 
rigidity and sort of strictness to that sort of form of sculpture. But I wonder as well often um, when people kind of become quite used to it that the work sometimes also disappears as well. If people overlook sculptures or perhaps the sort of the history of the event that it might, you know, um, acknowledge. Um, it's interesting how often you can walk past a sculpture in a public space and not sort of actually pay any attention to it. So it's interesting the kind of visibility and kind of invisibility a little bit of... Yeah, yeah, it's like the strategies of dominance just kind of work against them somehow. Like mm. they're so large and tall and permanent and ignored. Mm. Like you just sit and watch one for half an hour and no one stops to look at it. It's like no one, thousands of people walk past them in the city and they're just quite invisible, which mm. makes it a kind of interesting thing to bring attention back to. And also I'm quite interested in what shapes public space, the kind of objects and buildings and things that we end up with. And it can be almost kind of insidious in how quickly, you know, a community will acclimatize to what's shaped their public space. Mm -hmm. So yeah, interested mm. in that. It's interesting that kind of the balance of this sort of ambivalence of this desire to kind of lock something down and to try to kind of represent it um, in such a sort of solid form and then yet um, despite all of that intention um, our overlooking and how things kind of slip out of our attention and yeah mm, yeah I wonder as well like thinking perhaps a little bit about the work in the show um, and knowing your sort of interest in figure in the round and the sort of I guess the kind of problematic qualities of sort of um, sculpture and sculptural archetypes that we've sort of been discussing. Um, what was sort of appealing to you about this format that you felt could kind of talk to sort of the sculptural context, but um, maybe resisted sort of a desire for sort of strict representation or, you know. Of the work in this exhibition. Yeah, of this yeah, the yeah. work behind you. Yeah, so um, I was thinking again, I mean, what's really interesting about figural sculpture is it kind of condenses a lifetime into an image and it's a fixed image and it, there's certain emphases and things that are also repressed as well. And in, in the case of public sculpture, especially when they're meant to be representative of a community or communal values or societal values, there's um, this kind of funneling of, uh, you know, a multitude of contradictory ideas and ways of being into one figure that is you know, it's kind of, when you think about it, it's always bound to fail. Like, there's kind of this intensity and this idea to lock this down in a thing that, um, it's like it's a project that could never work. Um, uh, but thinking about different, uh, like complexity, basically, personal complexity in this case. Um, so I've called this work, uh, thought of this work as an evacuated figure in the round. So mm -hmm. instead of um, the side of the, f of the body, uh, it's the perspective of that, so um, it's kind of like a point of view or a this or you know a vantage point out onto the gallery and this exhibition is all based around language and articulation um, and both works just uh, kind of riff off a fragment of text um, and this one is this work of the uh, stained glass um, is based on a quote of Robert Storr in conversation with Felix Gonzalez Torres and they're talking about Felix Gonzalez Torres' work not um, being obedient to any one kind of art historical category. So, you know, gay, queer, Latino, HIV positive artists, that kind of thing. There's always an ambivalence or an openness to interpretation. And the quote is, a vision that is always structured through his multiple horizons of experience. And I'm quite interested in the problem of how like figural statuary um, language and the mechanisms of art history and art curation tend to lock things down in order to be able to, to position them um, and to attract audiences and to historicize. Um, and how that is all very anti-complexity. Um, and especially with deceased artists, they become really manipulable because they've stopped doing things so they don't contradict their own readings. Um, and I was thinking about just very kind of systematically retranslating that fragment of text into visual language. So looking at glass, and glass is just something I've wanted to work with for a while, um, and how its visual language is quite um, uh, kind of entwined with how we talk about memory and experience. So 
you know, the idea of a tinted memory or a textured kind of feeling. Um, and each one of these, how I think about them is kind of like maybe a crystallization of a formative experience or a memory that has its own kind of quality and texture and pattern. Um, and as you move around the work, they will also cross over and kind of interrupt each other's uh, vantage points. So, you know, we're, that idea that we're always looking at the world through our own uh, various experiences. Mm -hmm. We all have our own kind of worlds, essentially, that are informed by how we understand what's around us. Um, yeah, so it's kind of, it's, it's, I've lost track a little bit of where I was going. I don't know if I answered your question. No, you did. And I guess, are you comfortable with like framing these as kind of calling them lenses? Like, do you, is that kind yeah. of quite a clear intention in the work as to kind of what you were just saying then around all of the different kinds of It's definitely of lens like, the yeah. circular, yeah. And the, I mean, the form of them is, as horizons um, is a very literal kind of translation, but it's also that kind of very simple gestalt that is just two circles that are mirrored and cut apart in different ways. Is just something I've been attracted to for a really long time. So when this idea came up and then that idea that's been nagging me for a long time came together, that's how the work kind of mm. came about. Mm. Um, and yeah, lenses for looking through is very, you know, literal, but also sens sensible kind of reading. Um, yeah, mm. fine with that. And I guess when we're thinking about like, if we're talking again about this kind of the archetype of like sculpture and figure in the round, it's kind of defining and dominating space um, and the kind of um, overly assertive quality of that. Um, I mean, how are you thinking about space in the context of these works? It seems like, you know, that is sort of an orientation. You know, you mentioned horizon lines and sort of the setting sun. And um, I'm curious, like, if you could kind of talk a little bit more about the sort of, this sort of perceived horizon line in the work. Yeah, well, um, each of the elements has a shared horizon line. So I wanted to suggest the um, idea of one person's point of view uniting all of them. Um, and so if you imagine one figure with their own horizon line, like we all have our own horizon line onto whatever we're looking at, that was a uniting uh, element. Um, and spatially, I wanted it to be something that you could move around and behind. Um, and. And I guess, I don't know, I'm not sure mm. exactly. Hey, and the colors, the is there a significance for you in the combination of colors? Because I know um, in the past that you've, you've used in your work sort of, um, sort of spectrum um, of color. Mm. Yeah, um, yeah. So does it kind of, is that like a connection to that previous use or? Uh, in a sense, I mean, I always wanted to use color in the, the way that I came to using the spectrum and using a lot of colour was not wanting to have any particular association to a combination because mm. we have colour coded to a lot of um, elements of, of culture. Mm. And so the idea is like um, to overcome that just being really maximal, just using mm. lots of different colours so that you avoid any particular kind of associations. Mm. Um, I mean, using the spectrum, you inevitably get the pride flag connection, which I'm fine with. But um, I also was just really interested in the idea of that totality. So again, it's a quite open kind of thing. Um, I tried to be, leave an element of chance up to this. So when I made them, I would pick the glass and pair the glass as I went. And the idea was that it would come together so that each would have its own integrity and logic. And then when it came together, it would kind of do its own thing. So there'd be an element of you know, revelation about how it would interplay mm. at the end. Yeah. And in terms of the process of making as well, is that, something that you conduct yourself or do you work with fabric? Yeah, um, so the glass is ready made and I had a cut and then I did the, um, the letting mm -hmm. in my studio. Yeah, just mm -hmm. learning from YouTube. Mm -hmm. anyway. Amazing. Yeah, um, but uh, on colour as well, I'm really uh, interested in artworks that have, um, offer a lot of avenues for pleasure, pleasurable experience mm -hmm. before necessarily needing to come to an intended meaning. Mm -hmm. and. Um, colour is something I enjoy and there's a kind of sensual um, or sensorial kind of stimulation that comes with it. Um, and so I guess I, I kind of want that to be there. I want that to be something that can, people can just enjoy before they have to mm. think about mm -hmm. what else might be my intention. Yeah, sure. And I guess moving from, from this work and this sort of, there seems to be kind of a desire to kind of play with sort of translucency, transparency and opacity um, 
and looking at the neon work, um, which seems to be such a kind of an, an overt kind of denial almost. But mm. um, the thing I've I've spent a bit of time with it now, having been in the space, um, the thing that always strikes me is, um, despite there being this kind of desire for denial, that there is still this beauty that's kind of emanating from it and the kind of mixing of the colours on the wall. Um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about your thinking around this work. Yeah, so I've been really interested in the notion of illegibility mm -hmm. for a while. Um, and uh, the redacted word is a kind of particular kind of illegibility where there's a presence and there's, you know, knowledge that there's, that there's something there, but it's also withheld. So it's kind of a presence that is not ceding all of its information or announcing itself or, or being didactic. Um, and this, there's some really interesting writing around, you know, what a queer aesthetic might look like mm -hmm. um, and how to hold that kind of mutability um, so to resist uh, the concretizing of what a queer identity might be, but not also then becoming entirely invisible. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to really, really just to work with the idea of connotation so that there's, um, you know, there's an eminence of something behind there and you can see that there's words behind there, but they're not given. Mm. Um, but there is still something, I think, I, you know, yeah, I don't know if anyone's had this response, but I wanted to think about it as a, a kind of positive thing where there's space for, you know, imaginative projection mm -hmm. of what the words might be. And the people who've responded most strongly have been more troubled, like they really want to know what's under there. Um, and for the moment, I haven't been telling people because I'm just interested to see what the effect is of not telling people for the moment. And it's a piece, it's just a few words drawn from a really good piece of queer theory that gets used uh, a lot and it became it's kind of become its own kind of concretizing methodology like every time or not every time but in so many good exhibitions this this thing is referenced and it's almost become solidified mm. um, and it's it's really good thinking I understand why it's used so often but I also think it's interesting to work against always you know offering that explanation mm -hmm. if you like mm -hmm. yeah I guess there's that kind of um, where seemingly compelled um, so often in this world to say what we mean and what we're saying and to be constantly kind of justifying mm. our actions. And it's sort of been interesting seeing the audience's responses as well to this work because there's been a few people who've come in this week being like, well, what's, what's going on here? And yeah. um, I guess it's like the easy thought is that um, that sort of saying saying no to an extent in the way that this sort of covering does um, is a sort of a shutting down of kind of the experience of the work, but it shows that it's not, that there's sort of um, creative potential um, that can come from saying, well, I'm resisting sort of this, I'm resisting legibility um, mm. and something beautiful can kind of come of that, which I find um, uh, really intriguing about this work. Yeah. And so you see these as kind of, obviously you're, you're showing them in the same show and so there's a relationship between the two. How does mm. that sort of play out for you? Uh, well, they're both quotations. They're both um, dealing with, you know, queer artistic practices and the idea of what a queer aesthetic might be like. And then just moving that out of a textual written word into visual language. So expanding it back into something more, more visual and open and mm. sensual. Mm. Mm. In different ways. I didn't think about it till quite late, but they're both glass works as well. I wasn't mm. really thinking about that on a material level, but mm. yeah, mm. Um, light colour. Mm. And I guess you've sort of touched on this a little bit, but um, and I guess this sort of um, also connects to kind of you know, as and at least sort of my understanding of what that text was referring to. But I know you've written quite a lot about um, this kind of desire to constantly that queer identity is to be articulated by sort of, you know, bodies and, and sexual imagery and that there's this sort of a seemingly this language that we're expected to kind of speak through. Um, so you, you're interested in trying to expand the field of, you know, how to articulate queerness yeah. in art. Yeah. I just think it's an interesting problem because um, 
the the kind of uh, yeah queer for a long time came to be you know kind of shorthand for gay and lesbian and then got re-expanded and if you go back to its origins it's really much closer to an idea of intersectionality um, and uh, there's just you know uh, like endless complexity with that there's just going to be a field of representations that are one of you know infinite representations but um, I think mechanisms of you know um, critique and curation and art history just tend to well they kind of need to make positives that then they can work against um, or with and against and um, so this idea of an empty placeholder it's an idea that David Halperin um, wrote about uh, something that's always there but not uh, fully occupied by anything for any length of time mm -hmm. um, and it's just an interesting intellectual problem like you know it doesn't really um, yeah it's just something to to work with mm -hmm. like a problem to work with mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it feels kind of generative as well, like in, certainly in the context of this show, like to try to kind of articulate, mm. you know, what spaces are there beyond this kind of established sort of um, lexicon that we sort of, yeah. is projected onto us. Totally. Yeah. And I also don't want to be like, I don't want people to think I'm trying to displace all those other um, articulations mm. or like ways of being, mm. but it's more just like there's a kind of um, hierarchy I mm. think, and it's interesting to have this alongside mm. those other things. Yeah. Well, it's kind of, I think it's, it's sometimes kind of troubling, I think, when um, people at first think, you know, if, that you're denying this, or, but you're saying very clearly that you're not, you're saying that there is space to sort of explore, you know, a wider sense of what it means to make, you know, queer mm. art or um, queer abstraction, or um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about your interest in queer abstraction and and how that sort of um, informs the exhibition as well. Yeah, well, it's an idea that I came across more or less during Masters that seemed to give a articulation to things I was already interested in. Mm -hmm. So um, I kind of picked it up and ran with it. But this idea of um, reading into things and the intention of finding meaning in something that's maybe not totally explicit and that not being necessarily acceptable like this idea of if something is going to be categorized as you know queer or, or any kind of category there needs to be typically a pretty strong statement within the work about why it's like an evidential kind of approach which um, I find kind of a bit stultifying and so this idea of reading into something abstract and finding that meaning and asserting that meaning I thought was really interesting because it's also about uh, an intellectual position rather than uh, a fact, a factual thing. So it's more like there's, you know, there's there's my intellect and your intellect and all your intellects, and then there's the art object in between, and it's more of a a site of interpretation and, and discussion and things like that. Like the blank panels, for instance. You know, you can think of them as screens, and you know where anything could be appearing in mm. terms of meaning, or you could think of them as just being completely empty and devoid of meaning. Um, mm which would be the approach that's more like if it doesn't say what it is, then it's not that thing rather than, you know, more like it's a very specifically generated kind of space that could be seen to be loaded. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, and I guess knowing the, um, the show that you did at Marta in 2019, you know, as much as, you know, queer abstraction is, you know, of interest to your artistic practice, obviously you've engaged with it from a curatorial standpoint as well so um, I was kind of curious about you know the, the legacy of some of the artists that you showed in that exhibition um, and you know whether there's sort of any sort of influence that you see in this body of work as well that kind of came out of the experience of the Marta show um, maybe if you wanted to talk a little bit about the Marta show as well yeah so the Marta show um, included a lot of artists whose work that I knew quite well and um, who I knew it was an interesting kind of contradiction. Like they were chosen because I thought they had associations with queer practice and queer ideas, so there is a kind of identification there. But um, also uh, maintain a kind of obliqueness, either really deliberately or or less so. Um, and I was very clear. I asked, you know, invite each of them and ask them, you know, propose which works I wanted to show, and then said, you know, I want to apply this kind of reading to it, which is kind of um, 
they kind of practice ignorance to whatever they might have been intending of the work mm -hmm. um, to greater or lesser degrees um, for each artist. And um, I was really interested in the, the idea of queer abstraction in the Australian context and in historical context. So it went back 30 years in terms of the span of the work. And there was, you know, a work that I grew up with in my kitchen at home. And then there was works from Scott Redford, uh, John Mead, Fiona MacDonald, Bryony Galligan, and uh, Paul McKenzie. I think that's everyone. Um, yeah, it, it was interesting. It was, it was again like a crystallization work I'd been attracted to and people I'd known for a long time. Um, and there seemed to be a kind of uh, catalytic moment where this idea came into being, where I thought that I could draw a relationship between those works that would be you know, compelling and interesting to think about. Mm. Um, yeah, and again, it was the, the, the methodology of uh, apprehending a work and applying a reading is kind of that same thinking of, you know, um, you know, the art object is an object of interpretation and not necessarily um, going to always tell you exactly what its parameters are or, or how you can think about it. And I'm really interested in that kind of um, freedom of movement, mm. intellectual movement. Mm. I wondered as well, like thinking about like abstraction in a more kind of canonical sense, um, do you sort of see any kind of risks of sort of um, homogeneity in like engaging with sort of abstraction and you know and queer abstraction and like what what sort of difference is there for you in that um, between those terms yeah I mean it, there's a danger I mean it can all fall down if people you know don't think about it in the ways I guess I'm thinking about it mm. and how you know they, they could and could not think about it but that's also appealing in that it's not um, it's not solidified mm. so it's a kind of inherent risk um, in the positioning of the work is that it relies on that framing and sympathetic engagement and support and that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, abstraction can be seen, or non-objective non abstraction can be seen to be, you know, apolitical. Um, but again, that's a way of thinking about things. Um, and, you know, adherence to certain types of didacticism or figuration, I think, are equally politically problematic if perceived mm. from a particular standpoint or, or exercised in particular ways. Mm. So, I was struck yeah. by what you said in the essay with the Marta show around the Scott Redford abstractions as well, of which had AZT mixed into, mm. the, into the pigment. Yeah, um, yeah. And, um, and there's sort of shapes that would be interpreted as kind of just geometric, but actually were sort of echoes of, you know, um, you know, skin you know lesions um so it's yeah it's interesting the kind of the dynamic there um i wondered as well um as maybe a way to kind of wrap up and then maybe we can segue to any kind of audience questions um is you know knowing this desire of yours to kind of expand the sort of terrain of of queer art um and sort of the language that it you know can use what sort of dreams persist in you for queer art and you know what do you hope this sort of body work adds to that um i haven't really projected that far ahead but <laughs> <laughs> you just kind of put it out there um and uh you know wait for responses yeah. i suppose um you know i haven't really thought of it in, in that sense hmm. very clearly you can maybe that's an opportunity maybe that's the talk. way i think about it i haven't thought about it yeah, <laughs> yeah. thanks thank you are there any questions from the audience? We have some time for a couple. If anyone has anything they'd like to ask? I've just got a couple of comments. Mm. You're right in the discussion of perspective, which is because in our extended family, we have young children. Also, my father has two nieces' children. So his mind is looking in parts and people's heads at the time. And so he would be seeing in really quite diverse mm. kind of angle, um, let alone an intellectual perspective. Yeah. It very much screams, but it like created that show in the light show, turn the things that you all have described. But it becomes circular, not text, because mm. the colour is circular. Colours are pretty, but we like them. But the italics are kind of like, hey, 
Mm. So I'm like, I don't care about the words, it's like yeah. the attitude that tells. Mm. Yeah, I was thinking about it as um, italic, you know, uh, didactic panels are not italicized and they're generally not segregated for individual words either. Um, but I wanted to uh, add a sense of um, assertion, like, you know, someone making a statement, mm. because it is, you know, a quotation, so it is, you know, something someone has... You can't do anything if it wasn't. Yeah. It would be more static as a, as a, um, what do you say, old-fashioned in a sense. You know, it's kind of like, yeah, I really like this piece because there's so many layers of things popping up in my head when I watch it. So mm. I think yeah. that's part of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I thought about the italicised blocks for it a long time. Um, and also just going back to the, the edges of them and the circularity, um, that was a way I was thinking about the horizon again. It's like the key word of this exhibition would be horizon because it is this word that is used over and over and over again in queer theory and writing about queer artists and this idea of um, the, the embodiment or meaning of figuration always being on the horizon, so suggested and connoted but not yet arrived. And I'm interested in the fact that, the, you know, we, in writing can't seem to get beyond that visual image, like, and so it seems like really ripe to bring back into, um, yeah, visual form. I just wonder, you two speak about the queer theory, because even right back to the 70s, feminists had to um, defend their right to do laundry as a man. Yeah, yeah. Right? It's a, it's a huge thing, it's still there now. Mm. Yeah, same same problem. Yeah, same problem. Mm. Thank you. Can you Um, you know, it's, yeah. Um, it's a line about what a queer aesthetic might look like. So, um, I mean, I'm experimenting with how much information to give away. Like originally, I wanted much larger block quotes, but it's just too expensive with all the neon. Um, and then providing a kind of reference so that if you were curious, you could go and find out what it was. And if you didn't really care, then it didn't matter either. So yeah, just experimenting with how much information to give people um, and how much um, yeah, traction it, it might have in, t in terms of people's thought and interpretation. He's one of those people that just pops up a lot. And I've been keeping track of all the, you know, shows around queer abstraction over the last four or five years. And he's basically mentioned in relation to every one. So it's just, it's a foundational thing. So an interesting that has become foundational. The thought is like, the thought within the writing is kind of more anti-foundational, but you know, some, and you know, he's deceased as well. So he can no longer actually extend on those ideas. Mm -hmm. um, which is interesting too. One more question we have time for, if anyone has any other thoughts. If not, um, I could ask everyone to thank Andrew for his time today and congratulations on the show. Thank you, yeah. thank you for coming. Thanks, Tim. <laughs>